said God cannot lie. He promised to save his people. He never changed his mind. Today he still calls them my people. My people. My people. Can't you see? Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. I want to greet you on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. As we get into the Word and continue our study of our look at the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And we have reached the last part of that study as we will be doing the church at Laodicea tonight, today, this study. This time, this station. Yes. But before we do, I'm going to ask Mark once again to just ask the Lord's blessing on our time together in His Word. Oh Lord, we just thank you for your Son and the whole plan of salvation and for your, your Word that reveals it. Just bless this get-together to reveal your Word and to get it in our brains and our hearts. Amen. 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 Well, as I said, we're, we're, we've looked at the first six letters to the six churches, and I think we're entering probably what is the most significant part of the study, if there is a more significant part. Because the church at Laodicea, in the very beginning of the study, I said, well, you know, there, there are different approaches to the seven letters. Okay. And, and I hold to, to basically all three of those the seven churches are seven literal churches mm -hmm. at the time that they were written when John was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos around 90 AD. Okay. But in addition to being those churches at that time, they would surely seem to represent the history of the church at any time, mm -hmm. that at any given point in time since the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, you can see the traits that are in the seven churches in church somewhere. Right. right, But by the same token, they may represent, a, a, to a great degree, a history of the church, progressing from Ephesus through uh, our last one, Philadelphia, and now into Laodicea. So in that case, Laodicea would represent the very last picture of a church on earth before the coming of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in other words, the last day's church. And I think that's what makes it significant if indeed we are in those perilous last days that so we need to understand what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, as we closed last time, I talked about we were, we were leaving that church at Philadelphia, which the Lord has nothing bad to say about, mm -hmm. as we make the transition to the church of Laodicea, mm -hmm. which God has nothing mm -hmm. good to say about. Mm -hmm. This is the most unique church. It is the most unique church, and interestingly, historically at the time, there's a historian, uh, William Barclay, who says that the most unique thing about the Church of Laodicea is that there's nothing unique about the Church of Laodicea, because of the fact that it was kind of like wishy-washy. It was all things. It, had, it, it didn't stand out for any... It didn't take a stand on anything. It didn't take a stand on anything. Mm -hmm. It was a compromised church. That right? sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. So let, let's just start by reading the letter itself, and then we'll get into it, okay? Okay. All right, so I'll read from Revelation 3, starting at verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him 
and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Laodicea was one of the three cities that lay, I mean, they were right close together. The other was Hierapolis and Colossae, the Colossians, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're very, very close together. And, you know, Paul wrote, when he wrote to the Colossians, he mentions that he had also written at the same time to the Laodiceans. Right, yes. And he tells the Colossians that the letter that he sent to them, they should, they should send to and be read at Laodicea, right. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Now, I, it would be pure speculation on my part because, you know, you don't know this, but I just find it interesting. I wonder what happened to Paul's letter to Laodicea. Okay? I mean, we have a letter to the Colossians preserved for all eternity. Uh, I just wonder if it's because they didn't have a high regard for Paul, for Paul or nice the, word. the word that he was teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> Laodicea was one of the richest of the seven cities. Mm -hmm. It was like a banking center for all of Asia Minor the time, right? When Paul wrote to the Colossians, it was like, which is around 62 AD, probably about 30 years before John is on Patmos and, and Laodicea is receiving this letter from Jesus. Mm -hmm. all, all those cities right there were struck by a massive, massive earthquake and devastated the entire area. Rome offered Laodicea, as it did some of the other cities, financial assistance to rebuild the city. They, they didn't take the money. Hmm. They said, we don't need your money. Wow. They, that's, I mean, that's exactly right. That's a, that's a historical fact. Hmm. Okay. Laodicea said, you know, we don't, we don't, basically we don't need your help. She preferred to rebuild the city out of her own resources with no help from us. That's what Tacitus, the Roman historian, said. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So there's a certain amount of pride going on there right then. Oh, yeah. You know, 30 years before here. And like, like uh, Pergamum, Laodicea had a, a fine medical school, which was especially famous for its treatment of eye troubles. Mm -hmm. Okay, Remember, what Jesus speaks to these churches is very relevant to them and should stir things up in the church that's receiving or the people that are receiving it. Well, it's a way to remember what is said here. Well, because he links these things. He, there, there is always a link between the natural and the spiritual, yes. if you have spiritual eyes. You know, it says that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually appraised, mm -hmm. but the spiritual man is supposed to appraise all, all things spiritually. spiritually. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there's always a link between the natural. This is what Paul writes to the Romans. He said God reveals his divine nature mm -hmm. through what he's created, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the city's wealth came from its production of very, very, this was unique, high-grade uh, black wool, which was soft and dark. And the town's factories made at least four different kinds of garments, which were sold all over the Roman world. Mm. The church in Laodicea was probably founded during Paul's stay in Ephesus. And if you remember our study of Ephesus, it's, that was a time when Paul was there when he was a, he had started a church and was a pastor of the church and he was teaching there. Mm -hmm. The word was going out all over Asia Minor from there, and that's what it talks about. So that is probably the time when Laodicea first got the word. Um, the one drawback in Laodicea's location was its lack of water. It did not have its own good water supply. Resource. So it could get water from the hot springs uh, to, I think, to the south of it, and cold water from another city. Mm. And it was it actually came in from aqueducts. Uh, so it came in lukewarm. Well, it, would get well, it was mixed together. It was either mixed together, or by the time it traveled through the aqueduct, it had become the cold water had become lukewarm, mm -hmm. or the hot water had become lukewarm. Right. All right. Um, The other thing that I wanted to mention, and we're not getting into too much of the history, Laodicea becomes kind of a Christian center afterwards, after the time of the New Testament churches. Okay. And it was the seat of one of the, a uh, couple of very, very famous church councils in the 300s. The first was the Nicene Council, and the other was the Laodicean Council. 
And in the Laodicean Council was one of the places where uh, there's such a, a blatant separation of Christianity from Judaism, where it, it became one of the canons, because by that time the church is making canon law, right? You know, we've been set free from the law. Uh, there are now more, in, in the Catholic Church, for example, there's more canon law than there were Levitical laws. So they're creating these canons, these laws. And one of the laws was that a Christian must work on a Saturday, because otherwise you were perceived as a Jew. I mean, there's such bitterness and hatred and separation from the Jews, quite unlike the Apostle Paul, who in, in uh, the book of Romans talks about how he would have given up his own salvation for them, right? Yes. There had been a rich and very influential uh, Jewish community long before the Christian era, but most of the people there in that town worshipped Zeus more than any other guy. Okay. You don't mind I ramble. Okay. Ramble on. Before we go in again to, to really look at the Church of Laodicea, you've got to consider what's transpired already with the other six churches. Like I said, God has nothing good to say about the Church of Laodicea. Think about what he had commending the earlier churches for. And I'll just give you some examples. He said, these are the things that he, that he approved of in the other churches. You cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. You hate the deed of the Nicolaitans. You hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Your love and faith and service and perseverance and your deeds of late are greater than at first. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Those are some of the things that the Lord says to commend the prior churches. Right. Given the fact that there's nothing commended in, in here in Laodicea, these things, these things particularly, are absent. Mm. Yeah. Does that make make yeah. sense? Yeah. They have to be absent. In other words. They could tolerate evil men. Yes. And they didn't test false apostles. Right. All right? They weren't testing the word. Which right off the bat tells you that they didn't have this regard, this high regard for the mm -hmm. word of God. The Nicolaitans, when we study, and if you go back, all these studies are, are still available here on the website, how they were a clerical class where all of a sudden the church is becoming organized and structured. And there's a, a you know class system within the, the special people who are the ministers, and there's the lay people, right? Well, apparently, Laodicea didn't have any problem with that whatsoever, and that becomes more evident in its history later on, right? They didn't have perseverance. Now, you know, if you look at the letters to the other churches, there, there are times of trials. There were trials and persecutions and tribulations. And Pete, Paul, writing to Timothy about the perilous last days, and I said this is a, a letter about the last days, right. he talks about the persecution that is coming. Jesus, in Matthew 24, talked about the persecution that is coming. Paul talked about it, how many would fall away because of that, right? Well, they were prosperous. They were happy. They were comfortable. They didn't, you know, they weren't prepared for persecution in hard times. That leads me to this question, and here's an important question. We're talking about seven letters to seven churches. Yes? Yes. yes. What's a church? A building. Well, no, what, what's, a, what's a church? A body of believers where yes. Jesus Gathering. dwells. Okay, her first answer, my sweet patootie over here, was it's a building. And by the way, if you go to a dictionary, you're liable to find the very first definition that they gave is it's a building. Okay. Mark says it's a body of believers. Well, it's how many times would you guess that the word church appears in the New Testament? It's ballpark. Just take a rough guess. About 100. Mark thinks about 100. That's not a bad guess, by the way. Uh, the, the correct answer is zero. But, it, it, well, uh, <laughs> aren't these called churches? Not in the... 
A cootie. <laughs> they, they... Trick question. Chip, chip, trick question. In the original Greek, mm -hmm. the word church doesn't exist. Right. Okay? It's not a translation of a Greek word. It is a, a, a transliteration. It's a substitution. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, the word church does not exist in the New Testament. Right. Okay? The word that exists is ecclesia. And ecclesia is a Greek word that means a gathering of people who have been called. Okay? Mm -hmm. With me? They're called out. Well, yes, because it actually, called the out. earliest uses of the word you see is in the Greek Senate. Because the senators were called together to meet, all right? Mm -hmm. And that's the word ecclesia. So ecclesia is a gathering of people. Okay? Which is your first definition, by the way, right? right? And that's the a good definition. Church becomes a word that is created because there's kind of a vested interest in, in this term. It becomes a church term, yes. a religious term. Yes. All right? But it doesn't actually exist in the New Testament. If you it, it, Literally, the word is ecclesia. And <clears throat> the thing about that, and I have a reason for talking about this, because it's something that's been, I don't know, it's prodded my spirit for many, 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 many years. Um, I want to read three places in the book of Acts where that word, where ecclesia is. Okay, the Greek word ecclesia is. In Acts 19.32 it says, So then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know what reason they had, for what reason they had come together. All right? So the word ecclesia there is, is translated assembly mm -hmm. in your Bible. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then down a few verses in verse 39 it says, But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in lawful assembly. Mm -hmm. There's that word ecclesia. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's translated assembly. Right. And then in that same passage, in that same account of what's going on, it says after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Verse 41. Mm -hmm. So that's that word, ecclesia, and in each of those cases it is translated assembly. So it's different. It's not translated church, yeah. but it's exactly the same word that's used here in the beginning, like of Laodicea, to so the church of Laodicea. So the, the reason for me saying this is, it's really important that you know what a church is. Right. And I have, I said this is, this has been a kind of a passion of mine. I have taught around many places in the world about this, all right? What's church? But you could say that word to anybody, and they all come up with the same picture. Because most people will think of it's either a building, right. or it is a religious organization, right. you know, right. a denomination, for example, mm -hmm. right? Most people don't think of well, you know, we, we got together at the we got together for pizza by the end of the night, and there was three of us believers there, and we were focused on Jesus Christ. Is that church? Yes. Is that church? Absolutely. Well, according to the Word of God, it is. A little more gathered. So, think of this now. It. I can't tell you how important this is. I and since I can't tell you how important it is, I can tell you that the Lord can tell you how important it is. If you talk to him about it, yes. defining what the church is, is important. Satan wants to rob us of our words so he can rob us of our understanding of God's word. Okay? Right. Church is a gathering of believers. Yes. That's what church is. doesn't matter where, listen, in the early church, in the, in the early New Testament church, they didn't have buildings. They went house to house. They met house to house. Well, they talks about, and it talks about, it doesn't talk about that house now becoming a church. Mm -hmm. It talks about, well, the, the, the church that meets at that house. Mm -hmm. right. Because the church is the people. Right. It's okay? the living stones. Yes, it is not a building. It, okay? This becomes very, very important because if you don't understand this, you'll not understand that. That defines a relationship between God and man. It defines a right relationship between Christian and Christian, okay? And as you've said so many times before, when people 
believe the building to be the church, they will act differently inside that building than they will outside it. Absolutely. Absolutely they do. Okay? And, and yet there's a vested interest, it seems, mm -hmm. within the organized religious church to put a focus on the building. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay? Because the, the building becomes the focal point of the organization. Yes. Okay? Um, What's the difference between a gathering that we call a church and a gathering of something else? The focus. It's what you're focused on. Well, it's That's also that. who's in the gathering. Well, no, no, no. I mean... Well, what's your focus it, What I'm well, saying is... One particular person that's in the gathering. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, here in the... Where, I'm, where I mentioned that, that word that is typically translated church in the New Testament, where it's translated assembly, it's still a gathering of people. people. It's, it's a gathering of people. And they were focused on something, okay? What they weren't focused on was the Lord. So if it's an assembly that is focused on the Lord, that becomes what we call the, the church. Mm -hmm. But church is basically, in a, in a great sense, a made-up word. Mm -hmm. All right? In the Greek, it actually comes, if you do the etymology of the work in the Greek, or the German, which is basically where the, the, the English... The English word church has its root in, in the German. You can trace it back and it would go back to the house of the Lord. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we are the house of well, the Lord. Well, that becomes the entire question is what's the house of the Lord? Because, uh, again, I will tell you that, listen, I've taught pastors' conferences. I go in, and this is not an uncommon thing for me to do. I go in and I was like, you know, how many of you believe, I say to the pastors, how many of you believe the Word of God? Of course, every hand shoots straight up where I go. I say, how many of you will start your services Sunday by somebody in the church saying, welcome to the house of the Lord? And they do. Absolutely. Well, I say, well, then that's a, that is a, that's a satanic life in the pits of hell. The Word of God, the eternal Word of God, the Word of God that's a light to our, on a lamp to guide us, right? says that God will not dwell in a house built by the hands of man. New Testament and Old Testament, it says that. Yes. God will not dwell in a house built by the hands of man. Where does he choose to dwell? In us. We are the house yeah. of God. So, as Alan said, what happens is, and this is the, this is the ultimate evil result mm -hmm. of not paying attention to the truth, which we're supposed to rejoice in, is that you're training Christians to behave differently in that building right. than they do while they're out in the world. So you become one thing inside and one thing outside. So I can go into I can go into some church on a Sunday and boy they are on fire for God. They are hot, hot, hot. And then they go to work on Monday and they are cold, cold, cold. And you know what happens if you take cold and hot and put them together? Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Is it true or not true? Absolutely. Okay. Now, if it's the last days, and we're talking about a picture of a last day church in Laodicea, mm -hmm. there's just a couple of verses I want to mention, which we've mentioned many times before, I'm sure. Okay. Jesus taught in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, the, his disciples come and they say to him, tell us, what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? So they're specifically asking him about the end times. And one of the things he says is that there will be a great apostasy, a great falling away. You can't fall away from some place you aren't at. Okay? If you want to fall off the Empire State Building, you've got to be at the Empire State Building. If you want to fall away from Christianity, you have to have been there. The same thing in 2 Thessalonians, when Paul writes to the church there, he talks about a great apostasy. Before the Antichrist, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, there will be a great apostasy, a great falling away. Now, I know that a lot of, a lot of Christians, a lot of denominations teach that you can't fall away. Well, they're just simply, I'm going to say they're simply wrong, okay? It's very, very clear if you go to John chapter 6, when it says many of his disciples, not many of the just hangers on or just followers, it says many of his disciples were no longer following Jesus. They chose to walk away from him because his word was too difficult. That's apostasy. All right? So, 
if we look at the church of Laodicea, and the reason why I asked about church in the first place is, is it a church? Mm. Let's talk about, yeah, is, it, is it, or is it just an assembly? Yes. It can be, it can, you know, it is an assembly, but it can be focused on Jesus or not focused on Jesus. An assembly of people, listen, you go to, this weekend as we're filming this, uh, this is Super Bowl weekend. Oh, right. A lot of people are going to be assembled. A lot of people, tens of thousands of people are going to be assembled in a football stadium. Thousands of people around the country, around the world, are assembled in homes. Watching. They are not assembled on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are assemblies. They're not church. Okay? With me so far? Absolutely. Okay. So, I, I always had a problem with, uh, and I want, to, I want to be filled with God's grace, all right? The church at, of the Galatians, for example, Jesus said, don't you call a brother foolish, right? Back in the Sermon on the Mount. Yet Paul says to the Galatians, he said, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That's a strong statement. Yes, it is. Very strong. That's an incredibly strong statement. And I'm thinking to myself, is this really a church? Because Paul is saying, you have turned your back on the cross of Jesus Christ. You're trusting what you began in the Spirit, now you're trying to complete in the flesh. You've turned your back on the work of Jesus Christ and trusting in your own work. That's what he says to them. And he says, if you don't repent of that now, Christ Jesus will no longer be of any use to you. What he's saying is, if you don't repent of this, you're not saved. You're not Christian. You don't have that relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So now we come to the church of Laodicea, and I'm sitting here thinking, what do you mean church? What do you mean church? Yes, it's an assembly. If the focus is Jesus Christ, if, if you come together on Sunday to watch a football game and you're not a church, but you come together on Sunday to focus on Jesus Christ, and you are a church. Mm -hmm. The difference is Jesus Christ. Absolutely. When the focus is Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, Jesus Christ shows up. Aha! Aha! Because so means the focus wasn't on Jesus right. Christ. So, what makes the difference is the presence of Jesus Christ. He says, "With two more gathered in my name, right? I'll be there." Right. It is about the presence of Jesus Christ. Well, the church at Laodicea, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's outside. If he's outside, and he's he can't be inside. He's not inside. This is a church that he literally says, or it's an assembly of, of people, mm -hmm. that he literally says, You make me sick to my stomach. What does it mean? I'll vomit you out of my mouth. <coughs> I mean, what an, what an incredible thing. The goal, I, I, I talked about this so much, you know, I want, I want to be successful. You can go to a lot of churches this weekend and they'll teach about success mm -hmm. and they'll miss the mark entirely. Not you, Mark. And because, because the goal is to be pleasing to God. That you hear on that day that you encounter Him, that you come to Him face to face and He says, well done, a good and faithful servant. You pleased God. Mm -hmm. All right? What happens when you don't please God? He says, then he says, depart from me, you evil, and I never knew you. No matter how religious you were. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, many will come to him on that day. Not, not a few. He says, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. And he says, depart from me, you evil ones, I never knew you. Because again, the focus is not on Jesus. The focus is on Self. You know, there are so many people today who can't grasp the fact that <coughs> if people are doing good works, that that doesn't, you know, they believe that by doing the good works, they'll get to heaven. And if you try to tell them differently, they get very upset. Well, the, the, the reason for that is that has always been the base false gospel. Good works. That, that, well, let me phrase it another way that you can do something. To, get, earn to, to earn your salvation. Yeah. There's a verse, our, our works are filthy rags. Absolutely. Our, our good works are filthy rags to the Lord. Because Satan came to Eve, and, 
the woman, right? Yes, yeah. And he's basically said, you know, if you eat if you eat the fruit of this tree, you can make yourself like God. Mm-hmm. It's always been what you can do to make yourself like God. Yes. The fact is, you can't do anything to make yourself like God. But it's always been. Here's the, the crazy thing: it has always been his declared purpose to make you exactly like him. Mm-hmm. He said, let us make man in our image. The promise to believers, the great promise to believers, is that from the, from the potter to the clay, is that whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. You don't have to do anything. You can't do anything. And if you think that you can, you have believed a lie from the pits of hell. So the false gospel has always been a gospel of works, one way or another. And all false religions are based on what you can do to achieve your right relationship with God. When there's nothing you can do except, 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 accept the free gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, is exactly what it says. It's nothing we deserve, nothing we earn. Nothing we deserve, nothing we earn. Accept the free gift of God's salvation. So, if Christ is not present in this assembly at Laodicea, then he's not in the place. Now, you see, regardless of what the place is, and this is one of the things I teach a lot on, and people don't, it's, it's hard to grasp, I will tell you that, because we have been so conditioned by a world-minded church if you, if you meet two other believers in Publix mm-hmm. and you greet each other in the name of the Lord and just, you know, you, you can talk about groceries and you can talk about Jesus mm-hmm. because he should always be on your mind. Mm-hmm. You have in church. You're on holy ground. You're on holy ground and That's you right. have in church, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to have a, a cross on a steeple. Stained it doesn't have windows. to, stained glass windows. It doesn't have to have padded views. That's not what it's about. It is about being gathered in the name of of the Lord. And the problem becomes, as we just talked about, the fact that if you don't understand that, then you lose the sense of being the most important thing that you are, the temple of the living God. All of a sudden, it becomes a building project because that's what's important. You are what is important. Jesus never died for a bunch of building stones. He died for you. You are the reason that he came to earth to die. That's how precious you are in his sight. Satan wants to rob you of that truth. He wants you to rob to rob you of that knowledge. He wants to rob you. He wants to steal that understanding that you are an ambassador of Christ. You carry his presence in every place that you go. You are the temple of the living God. And meanwhile, you'll walk into a building on Sunday and, okay, we've got to raise money for another building project. Forget about it. That's not what's important. What's important, you know, it doesn't matter where we meet. We are building monuments to our own glory all over the world with these massive, massive church buildings. And mausoleums. The early church, by the way, the early church never called a building a church, even after the New Testament times. They called it a Domus Ecclesium. It was the house of the church, not the house of God. The house of God, the only house of God on earth is a a true believer. Never, never a building. Never, ever, ever a building. And as we've said here already, and this is so important, if you come to believe the lie, then you will behave differently in that building than you do outside the building. And the focus will become the building rather than the kingdom of God. So, it's in the gathering. He said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. Right? Okay. If if he's, Jesus said, if two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. And here is a whole bunch of people assembled together in Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And he's outside. He's not in their midst. That's right. For what purpose have they gathered? I can't tell you for what purpose they have gathered. I can tell you why they they have not gathered in his name. They have not gathered to be focused on Jesus Christ. You've had a quandary, you know, 
it's it's called a church in verse 14. But then... But the, 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 Hebrew, the Greek word is assembly. Okay. Okay. I'm throwing you up, eh? Okay. <laughs> but then it should have been translated assembly because, well, this is a message to Laodicea, or does it say at the beginning, before... You know, before the seven church churches start, it says a message to the seven churches. My, this is my or the message to the seven assemblies. Ecclesias. It doesn't yeah. The word church does not exist in the New Testament. See, this is a purple grass thing. Mm -hmm. The word church does not exist. There is no Greek word for, for church. There is a Greek word for assembly. Right. <clears throat> the people that translated the Bible into English chose to substitute assembly. the word church for the word assembly. Right? They chose to substitute the word. Yeah. It's not a translation. There is no Greek word in the Bible translated church. It is substituted. I know that's hard to, hard to grasp. Right? Listen, this, this Bible study is supposed to be a serious study for people who are serious about God's Word. Okay, when John wrote this, he wrote this to the seven assemblies. Assemblies, yes. yes. That uh, were, at least in the past, focused on Jesus Christ. Well, the word assembly doesn't Does imply it. anything other than, I mean, it's just a gap. The yeah, word assembly right. say, says a, a group of people have come together and assembled. Okay, now because assembly doesn't mean because John sent them the letters, they should have common interests. Well, but, you're, you're, but that's an assumption. You yeah. see, that's the, the assumption. The, po the point is, they are perceived in the world as they should listen. We got a real problem with what's going on here, trying to understand the Word of God. Yeah. Not just here. What, what about in Sardis? Sardis, you know, two letters ago, the Lord. This is rumor. It's not. These are not. John, it's not John writing the letters. Okay, he's a, a messenger in here. The Lord sends a message to the church of Sardis and says, "You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Mm. How can a church be dead?" By definition, a church is filled with the life of Jesus Christ. There's, there's nothing new under the sun, Solomon wrote. It has, it has been common since the beginning. You know, even how, how far back, how far back is there a problem inside the quote unquote church? How far back? Yeah. Need... No, no, in the church, in the New oh, Testament church. New Testament. How far back? Stephen. No. Judas Iscariot. Oh, right. Yes. I mean, here, right. here Jesus is walking with 12 hand-picked. Yes. And yet one of those hand-picked is almost like, you know, he's devil. the devil incarnate. Mm -hmm. mm. The wolf of Jesus clothing. And the scripture is filled with warning. Yes. And this is why I said in the very beginning, one of the things that God commended in the church, he said, you to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not yes. yeah. there have always been Satan tries to infiltrate the body of Christ to destroy it from within yeah. always has yeah. always will until the end right so the, the point is and I recognize this is a difficult thing because it's certainly not taught in the church no. because the, the church is an organization that is self-defending yes. it protects itself and when I say it protects itself one of the things it protects is its tradition mm -hmm. it presents it protects its hierarchy yes. it, okay am I trying to be radical I'm not radical the Word of God is radical That's right. I'll tell you the Word of God is radical the fact is that anytime two believers if two or more that's what it takes two or more That's right. It doesn't take a mega church with 25,000 people. If two or more gathered my name, he said, there I am in your midst. Yes. What I said that this is a picture of the last church on earth, Laodicea. Mm -hmm. 
I use a little poetic license because you actually the real picture of the last church on earth yes. are two, two witnesses. prophets, two That's witnesses. Right. Out of the entire population of the entire world, there will be two faithful left. Yes. And the world will hate them. Hate them to the degree that when they are murdered on the streets of Jerusalem, yes. the entire world will rejoice over their deaths. And they will party down for three days. Mm. Oh, three and a half. Three and a half. Until, mm -hmm. until, uh-oh, uh -oh. Yeah. Uh. you're going to hear the loudest uh-oh you ever heard in your life. That's, that's not even coming from the surface of the earth. No, <laughs> that's not coming from the surface of the earth. So the fact is, you know, the church has been building from the beginning. Look at look, look at the churches here. Like was it Sardis? Like Thyatira? I mean, you know, there's there's problems in the church. What's that saying that 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 you oh, had? What started in Israel? What started? Oh, the church started as a fellowship in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. a fellowship of believers. It became a philosophy in Greece. It became a culture in Rome, and it became an enterprise, a business, in the West. And it has. Sure. It, it, abs has. it absolutely has. And it defends, it, it protects itself. Mm -hmm. Instead of being willing to deny yourself and die yourself and humble yourself, the church has tried to elevate itself. What do you think we build these great big buildings for? I mean, I hear people, oh, we're going to build this building and people will be attracted to it. No, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, Amen. I will draw all unto yes. me, men unto me. And you know, when it comes to that cross of Jesus Christ, there's nothing in that that men should be attracted to him. Mm -hmm. Read Isaiah 53. That's right. It is the horror of the cross that demonstrates the glory of God, the mercy of God, and the grace of God. That's what will draw men. Not, not Starbucks coffee and donuts in the lobby of your massive megachurch. Mm -hmm. if I'm, I'm sorry if I've upset you. Well, no, I'm, I'm not. I Actually, I hope I stir something in yes. you. Yes, stir. You know, we, we, are, we look so little like Jesus Christ. And if you want to see the church of the end days look a little like Jesus Christ, look at the church of Laodicea. Yes. These people are gathered. There must be a big church. They're boasting. They're rich. They have need of nothing. And yet, they don't have Jesus Christ. They have need of nothing. The only thing they don't have is Jesus. They have nothing. They have nothing. They have absolutely nothing. That's what Jesus said. He said, you're poor, you're wretched, you're naked. And they don't even know it. Well, that's where we're getting to be in the church today. Poor and wretched and naked, and we don't even know it. Where is the glory of God? It's not in your stone building. It's in the life of a believer who is living and walking by faith, bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. That's where it is. Here in Laodicea, they're gathered. I don't know why they're gathered. It's a social club. And don't you think that a lot of your churches are not social clubs? That have nothing to do with God. That's not a church. It's an assembly. And it's the wrong kind. Do you, get there? you want to know something? If they say that they're rich and have need of nothing, I'll bet you they got some beautiful music going on. I'll bet you they got some beautiful yeah. music. I bet you they have some of the most talented musicians. Yes. I've been to churches where they have talented musicians. And somehow I didn't feel the presence of God. You know, it says in the Word that God inhabits the praises of His people. Yes. If they were singing praises inside the church of Laodicea, He couldn't be outside, He'd have to be inside. Because He inhabits the praise. So if he's outside, no matter what they're singing, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how talented they are, no matter how skilled they are, it is not of God. <clears throat> I'll bet they have some phenomenal preaching. I'll bet they got, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll bet they got people who'll stand there and hold you mesmerized with their, with their speaking, with their teaching, with their big smiles on their faces. But you want to know something? It cannot be the Word of God. Because the Word of God is standing outside. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. 
If he's not in there, the word of God is not there. I don't care how much that sermon tickles your ears. What is their focus on themselves? Well, Mark, I can yeah. take you to a lot of church. I, honestly, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this to try to be mean or anything else. But I've been to churches where the focus wasn't Jesus Christ. I, okay, let me let me just start. I'm talking about preaching the word. I've been in churches where where people. I've been in a church where a guy gets up every week and basically preach it, preach from the Reader's Digest or something. You know, nice homilies, nice, nice, you know, self-help messages, nice positive thinking, nice positive attitude messages. But it wasn't the Word of God. You want to really get scary? Without naming any names, I don't want to mention the Roman Catholic Church by name right now. But it, it says, I mean, their belief is, and this is their dogmatic, central belief, mm -hmm. is called the Eucharist. Yes. Yeah. The Holy Communion. The real presence. Because in Catholic theology, that is called the real presence. Mm -hmm. And that is central to all, quote-unquote, worship in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. That's Catholic theology. If you don't believe me, if you don't want to believe me, go study and look it up. I mean, I have to tell you, I've done graduate work in a Catholic seminary, okay? And things like that don't change over 20 years. No, years. things like that don't change over thousands of years. Yeah. That has been the teaching of the Catholic Church since the Catholic Church came into existence. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm not even going to... Go ahead. If that's the real presence... If that building is a real presence, I mean, if this is what it is, and that's exactly what they teach, what's the rest of the presence? Not real? His presence because we're gathered? His presence because of his word? Is that, that's not real presence? You know, one of the things that struck me many, many years ago is in Psalm 69, where it says, may their table before them become a snare, and when they are in peace, may it become a trap. And their table, they, you know, they call it that altar, the table where the communion is served, okay? Uh, it can become a trap, because you think that's where the presence of Jesus Christ is. And again, it goes to the issue. If you think that Jesus Christ, they lock up at the end of the service on Sunday in that little gold tabernacle on an altar off to the side. If you think that's where Jesus is, you're going to walk out of that building not take Jesus with you. Right. You have to go back and visit him. you got to go back and, and visit him. Daniel talks about, Jesus talked about, the abomination of desolation. And it's talking about the temple, right? Now you got a natural temple and you got the spiritual temple. An abomin abomination is something that is just horrible beyond belief, right? That's what abomination is. Yes. Desolation means it's something that should be there, is not there, it's empty. Desolation means it's empty, desolate, right? Yes. Destroyed. Well, no, it means it's empty. It means it's emptiness. There. Desolation is emptiness, okay? It's nothing. So if people believe that Jesus is, that's the real presence, that's where he is, and he is not, then what they're worshiping, worshiping is there's a desolation. It's a, it's a, it's emptiness. Um, I listen. I, I understand that I'm challenging the belief of literally, literally billions of believers or billions of people. 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 All I can tell you is, I don't ask you. I never ask you to take my word for anything. Go check and study and find out what your church believes. Most Christian, most Catholics don't have a real clue what, what their church teaches and believes. But more importantly, get into the Word of God and spend time talking with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Have a little talk with Jesus and see where it leads you, okay? God desires that you have the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. the full, he is life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No Jesus, no life. Here you have the picture of Laodicea, a gathering, an assembly. You can call it a church if you want, but it is devoid, it is desolate of the presence of Jesus Christ.
that is evident from his statement. You know, I, every time you hear this, that for, for 40 years I hear people using, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and that's evangelism. No, the Lord spoke that to his church. Not to those, not to the Hindus, not to the Muslims, not to the Buddhists. Jesus Christ spoke these words to a people who were saying they were his followers. He said to them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. These are those perilous last days where we had better start to take things seriously mm -hmm. because they are serious times. Don't perish for a lack of knowledge. Isn't that what Hosea said? God spoke to the prophet Hosea and said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. You are responsible to know. So I'm saying things and it's upsetting you and you're positive that you know what you're doing. Hey, that's between you and God. It's not between you and me. But I pray that maybe a little spark of curiosity will get to you. And you will go and have a little talk with Jesus. He's, you know, it says wisdom stands in the street and shouts. The Lord roars from Zion. He is not a God of, of hiding information. He is a God of revelation. He wants you to know because he desires that you don't perish because you don't know. These are serious times. It's not a time to be fooling around and taking things lightly. Like I said, a lot more people will come away this weekend knowing the statistics for the Super Bowl than know about the minor prophets in the Bible. Mm. A lot more Christians know a lot more about their favorite movie stars than they know about Jesus Christ. That's a fact. That's a fact. Yes. Perhaps you're running out of time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's time for you to get serious. Don't take my word for it. Study the word. Don't take my word for it. Talk to the word. Mm -hmm. And he'll tell you. He's knocking at the door of your heart, asking you to let him in. So, Father, I just I pray, Lord God. Lord, you said that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing will offend them. I pray that people out there who love you, love your word, will hear this and not get offended, Lord God, but get stirred. Stirred to pray and seek you that we would not just be an assembly gathered for this and that, but we would be a people gathered in your presence to come together to, to give you thanks, to praise you, to worship you, to love you more and more and more. Lord, put a burden for your word in our hearts. Let us remember that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Let us hunger and thirst for righteousness, Lord God that we might be satisfied. I praise you and thank you for the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, who did for us what we could never do for ourselves. In Jesus' name, Father, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, until next time. Until next time. Until next time. I know that Alice wants to tell you Jesus loves you. And Mark and I will say a lot. God bless you and goodbye until next time. Be used to the glory of his name.